Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the All Men, the All Moments, Eternally Nice podcast, the podcast where I, Max Haddad, uh, talk out of my ass. Uh, no, the podcast where I talk about stand-up for 20 minutes, my life, what's going on. Uh, and then um, we look at two news articles, one from a liberal or left-leaning uh, news site. And uh, and then typically it's been Fox every time, but a conservative site, an article from that that site. Fighting a cold, so I apologize uh, that, you know, it sounds like I'm chewing on gravel right now. It is what it is. Hopefully my voice will warm up as time goes on. But uh, yeah, it's been <clears throat> a stressful week. Um, I am going to uh, leave out some details, I think, because uh, I'm not trying to talk shit. Now, this podcast right now has a small following. By the way, I appreciate all of you. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in every episode. Uh, if you're a new listener, consider checking out some of my older videos. Uh, some of them are probably going to get taken down at some point, by the way. I'm, I, I'm looking back at some of them and they make me cringe a little bit because they're it's I I've, I was a little YouTube-y and I'm really trying to not be a YouTuber which is a hard thing to do when um, you upload to YouTube every week but uh, yeah and consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel uh, see that's and like I hate I hate saying that I really don't like saying that I like to just create a thing and hopefully people enjoy it but in 2023 you have to like promote yourself there has to be a call to action um i guess there doesn't have to be i can just accept that whatever happens happens i could do that i could keep my integrity and do that uh but you know um ever since i was a little girl i had a dream of being a famous princess so so please like and subscribe um yeah this week was stressful and uh, it's because there's this club that I've mentioned a million times. And like I said, I'm going to leave some details out because I'm really not trying to talk shit on any specific person. Uh, I'm just going to give you a synopsis of why shit was stressful. There's this club that I live very close to that I care very deeply about. Uh, it's helped me a lot as I came back to stand up to get comfortable on stage again. Like I thought coming back to stand up, I would have to like you know, like that it would be like riding a bike and that there would be some finite uh, muscle movements that I would have to re-implement, you know, but that I would just jump right back into being sharp on stage and confident on stage and I'd be very funny and I'd kill right out the gate and all. And none of that was true. I was so horrible when I first came back. I was terrified. It didn't matter if the audience was five people or a hundred people. I was horrified. Uh, and I had no opinion that anybody should listen to. I had forgotten what having a perspective looked like. I had forgotten how to be vulnerable on stage. I had forgotten how to command an audience without being a complete asshole. Um, and I'm still learning that. I'm still meaner than I need to be sometimes, but uh, it's been because of this club, basically, that I have, and some, and some dear friends of mine who've, you know, put me on shows and things when I probably wasn't, uh, ready to be not ready to be, I was ready to be, but just like, you know, they were taking a risk, you know, you, when you're producing a show, you want the comedians to do well because you want the product that you're creating to be fucking nice. And, uh, I sucked. So it was not a guarantee that my set was going to be one that the audience enjoyed. Um, and you know, I'm going to try to say um less cause who wants to hear that shit? So this club's been very helpful. I care about it a lot. Because I live so close to it, I have slowly become pretty involved in the club. You know, it went from I was hosting there every third week or every other week, whatever it was, um, to, you know, featuring there pretty, I don't know, somewhat often, whatever. You know, I was just do, I was doing a lot of time there. Even when I wasn't hosting, maybe I'd pop in and do a guest set, that kind of thing. Pop in like I'm a famous person, but you know what I'm saying the owner was giving me a lot of time because we liked each other and he just trusted me and saw that I was a good guy that cared about this, this little, <laughs> this little art form. <laughs> I'm an artist. Uh, and I've just been there a lot. You know, I've just been there more than most people. There's certainly some that have been more involved than me, but I've been there more than a lot of people. And so I kind of wormed my way in, you know, I didn't do it on purpose, but I, I accidentally became uh, a trusted pseudo employee of this club which by the way is not why i got into stand-up at no point ever since i i think i started the first stand-up set i did i think i was 
19 or something. I wish I had started earlier than that, but I think I was 19. And I, at no point in the last however decade, whatever, have said, I want to work at a comedy club. At one point, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll follow Joe Rogan to Austin. Maybe I'll be like literally every other open micer in the world and follow mm -hmm. Joe Rogan to Austin and uh, try to be a door guy. And I know I'm friends with door guys uh, at that club. And so it felt like a reality. But then I went to Austin, visited, did some shows there, had a lot of fun, but realized like, I don't know if I want to live here, you know? And then I also was thinking like, um, I like Joe Rogan. I think he's a good uh, podcast er. I think he's a really smart guy when he chooses to be and when he's passionate about something. Um, but I don't think that he has, he and I are not living the same life. So his experience of Austin, uh, you know, as a millionaire, as an established comedian, as somebody with, is it still the most popular podcast in the world? I don't know. I'd have to look that up, but very popular podcast. His experience of Austin is going to be substantially different than mine. So I was like, you know, this is silly to go. Now, were there opportunities? And I and maybe feel a little bit of, you know, that FOMO, whatever, the f fear of missing out. Maybe I could have taken advantage of some things. Sure. But um, I decided that, you know what? I think me going to Austin is actually me running from something, not running to something. So I, uh, I didn't go. What the fuck? Oh, yeah. But that's the closest I came to wanting to be like part of a comedy club. Otherwise, like, yeah, I want to work at comedy clubs. I want to, you know, be a booked comedian at comedy clubs throughout the country. Sure. But not like I want to fucking, you know, hand people Bud Light and like, here's your chicken tenders. That's not what I got into this for at all. Uh, I've also been a server for most of my life. So like I didn't get into comedy to be like, oh, a second serving job. Now I can be a waiter at two places. That wasn't the goal. Uh, and you know, luckily this little club that I live by does not have food. So I'm not a waiter there, but I am involved in a very logistical way. Uh, not how I would have ever said I wanted to be. And I am okay with that. I am okay with that. But this last weekend, um, the people who would normally be in charge of things were out of town. They happen to be comedians themselves. They were doing shows in a different state. And uh, and then there was, a, it fell to another person and I was going to be kind of a warm body in the room. And then that person had something that, you know, they couldn't avoid. Um, and I, I became the guy. I became the guy doing the thing. All of it. First night, Friday, uh, the owner did find me some help, which was great so necessary, super useful, really appreciate, um, the Colin and Lauren, <laughs> Google them, Colin and Lauren, you're going to love them. Uh, but no, two people that came to help and I, they're awesome. Um, and funny too. And then end of Friday night, the microphone dies and the microphone dying in stand up is a, you know, it happens. It's a mechanical tool, whatever the shit breaks. I, it's, I don't, I don't think it's the microphone. I think it's the cable. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's not the speaker and it's not the, yeah, whatever. But I'm not in a position, here's how I'll say it. I needed to set boundaries and say, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to be, I'm certainly not getting paid for what I'm doing right now. I don't know if I'm going to be reimbursed for anything. I think I would be if I asked for it. Uh, but if there's not a backup cable or microphone or whatever in this comedy club, I'm not, I'm not make I'm not driving whatever amount of time to go to a store that's not close to go figure out what cables and this that I need to update the PA system and make sure the club has a like the club should have a backup of everything it just should I don't know if it's because I was in hospitality forever but like there are some business 101 things in my brain that that I ran into there were some business 101 things uh that were not happening at this club that I ran into this weekend that were really frustrating to me. Uh, frustrating because it put me in a bad spot and I don't think, and it doesn't, uh, it put me in a bad spot and I don't think that's fair to me. I think if I was the person in charge of all this stuff, I would have had everything, all my ducks in a row to make sure that if anything went wrong, it would be easily remedied. And other things, other things went wrong and finding solutions to those problems was not as easy as it should have been, I'll say. And there are, there are, uh, humans responsible for that. And I'm, I'm frustrated about it. 
I am because I know that this is how things were handled were not how I would have handled them. Uh, and just because I'm not right all the time doesn't mean I'm wrong always. And I believe that my my perspective on how this weekend went is is the correct one. So I'm not pissed, but I am I am looking at this club a little differently than I was a week ago. Uh, it was just uh, I am so lucky that the headliner and uh, the headliner brought a guest who uh, Sam Rager was the headliner. And uh, Elena Gonzalez was her friend that she brought along. Both comics, both very, very funny, both really good at what they do. And uh, please look them up. I don't know their like Instagram or anything like that, but Sam Rager, it's R-A-G-E-R. -E if you don't know how to spell Sam, get, stop listening immediately. Uh, I'm not smart, but this is all over your head. And Elena, it's L-A-N-A, -A, and then Gonzalez, how it's always spelled. Uh, look them up. I actually don't know where they're based maybe Chicago but I could be very wrong about that so don't trust me on that but look them up they're very funny and uh, had it not been them at the club this weekend performing I would have had a much harder time luckily they are both not only funny and uh, professional motherfuckers they are awesome people and I am really trying to not say awesome as much as I do because I hate it when I hear it come out of my mouth when uh, you know somebody's like uh i'm like hey you know mom can i get you drinks she's like i'll have a pepsi and i'm like awesome it's like is that fucking awesome <laughs> is that awe inspiring that my mom wants a pepsi so i'm trying to say it less i mean it they are really awesome people they had my back they did things that they shouldn't have had to do and that was embarrassing to ask people for help that shouldn't have had to handle any of any of the logistic stuff of the club they should have just got to show up and have a good time and get paid for it um, they had to do things. So are you vaping now? This was fucking wild too. Uh, I've been to this club over the course of like, I guess it's been open maybe like a year and almost two years now. I've probably been at this club as a performer 40 times, like a lot, a lot. It's very, very close to my house. Like I'm talking less than six minutes drive. I've been here 40 times. There is never, I've never seen a dog there ever. Uh, you're allowed to bring a service dog in. Of course, I think, uh, you know, it's a service dog. I'm not going to tell you no. And I love dogs. Dogs are some of my, can I show you my shitty Christmas tree and something I have here? Look, for those of you that are watching, there's my shitty Christmas tree. Look what's hanging above my mantle. Like that's not my dog, by the way. That's just a painting of a golden retriever. That's how gay I am. Like, I just love dogs. I love dogs. They're one of my absolute favorite things in life. If dogs didn't exist, I'd be like, you know, I think I can go. I think I get it. I think I get life. I'm cool. Dogs keep me going. So uh, I've never seen a dog there. So I'm like, Saturday night, I'm already frustrated. The microphone, like I said, die like the sound just the sound system it's just the cable but the shit goes down i didn't have time that day to go get fix that problem and i was also like you know what the owner knows what's going on they've not said anything about here's some money to deal with this i'm not going to go deal with this i'm not it's just we're just gonna unfortunately the owner was like maybe there's one in the club you know i'm, I'm gonna look if there's not one we're just doing it without a mic and that sucks by the way if you're a good comedian, you can definitely wrangle an audience and have control of the whole show without a microphone. I've had to do it. I've seen my friends have to do it. Like, you can fucking do it. And, and in some way, you know, this is a small room, so that's good. If you had to play to 500 people uh, in a big club or theater or whatever, like, to, to without a microphone, it's not going to happen. Even if you're great, like, some of the people are going to love it, but the people at the back are just fucked. This is a very small room. It's a very intimate room. Even with a microphone, it feels like we're doing spoken word poetry. Uh, and I mean that in like the best way. It's just very intimate. It's, a, it's, it's an emotional space. It's fun to perform in. So you can whisper your way through this fucking show if you need to. So that's what we had to do. There was no backup shit at the club. And uh, again, Sam Rager and Elena Gonzalez, professional motherfuckers, and they just absolutely killed it. You know, uh, Elena should not have had to, but she, I needed her to host Saturday night. I hosted Friday. I needed her to host Saturday because I was going to have to do more. There was not extra help there. 
Um, so they, you know, she hosted and she hosted without a microphone and she, there was an audience member that she had to like correct. Sometimes you have to correct adults. You have to like, I don't want to say scold them, but you have to like teach them the rules of a comedy show and you have to be very forceful about it. Um, I could not have done what she did. I could have done what she did, but not how she did it. Uh, and I, I would venture a guess that I could not have done what she did as well as she did it any way that I chose to do it. She absolutely killed it as far as uh, just in general. She was very funny and they loved her set, but like she just handled it perfectly without a microphone. I was like, fuck it. I'm bringing my dog. That's what I decided. Saturday night, I'm bringing my dog. I'm already annoyed. I already feel bad. I've been gone all day. My dog has not seen me. She's sad. I'm going to just leave her again for hours to go be pissed off because shit's not going great at this club and I'm, I'm taking on more responsibility than I ever agreed to. At one point, the owner and I did have a conversation. He said, how much do you want to do? How much responsibility do you want? And my answer, my stupid answer was as much responsibility as you'll give me. But the subtext of that was within reason. Running it by myself was not what I fucking meant. And I don't think it should have been taken that way. And so he and I need to have an adult conversation. It'll be fine. I'm not going to be mad. I'm not going to be mean. There's nothing to be mean about. We just need to talk about boundaries. Uh, anyway, so this, I brought my dog. And at the one time I bring my dog, uh, and my dog, I think you guys, if you've listened to every episode, you know my dog is amazing, but she does not do other animals. She can't be around other animals, especially dogs. The one time I bring my dog, some fucking dude brings his service dog. Big ass puppy. It's a puppy. I don't know what kind of dog it was. Maybe a Great Dane or something. He looked, I, I don't know what his story was. And my guess is he's a vet and this was like an emotional service dog. I'm not going to make fun of him for needing that or wanting that. I, it's not, it's a good thing in my opinion. But it became an inconvenience. And it's my fault. I'm the one that brought a dog to the club that's not a service dog, you know? But basically, she was. My dog was basically acting like a fucking service dog. She was certainly my emotional blanket. But, like, you know, so now I'm, now I'm causing problems, you know? This, this, this weekend that was already stressful, more stressful than I needed to be, now I'm fucking creating chaos by having a, a pit bull that will, will kill gladly, will tear out a throat, uh, around other animals. So I, I had to take my dog home in the middle of the show. Anyways, enough about me. It was just a stressful weekend. So I'm good, but now I'm, I'm sick and I'm guessing I'm sick because I was just so wound up this weekend. I did tell myself and I was proud of myself for this because you guys know how fucking weak I am. I was proud of myself. I said, um, I'm not going to get more stressed out than the owner of this business. And at no point did I. So I was happy with that. I said, a boundary and I just it was is cool. So I didn't freak out. I didn't get, you know, super angry. This is the most I've talked about it. This is the angriest I've sounded. Um, but it just was a lot. So I'm guessing I'm sick now because, and I, this is nothing by the way, this is just a little tiny head cold, like take a suit of fed and I'm cool. Um, and it'll be gone by tomorrow, but it's just, I'm guessing it's from the stress. So, uh, we always start on like the left leaning news website. We're going to start on Fox today uh just because because i want to so this is something that uh, strikes a little close to home um pun intended i guess cameron diaz which everybody you know when you think cameron diaz what do you think good advice right cameron diaz wants to normalize married couples sleeping apart or in different homes that's the name of the uh article and by the way i forgot to add links to last week's video if you wanted to read the articles on your own and uh and i'm not going to go back and fix it so i'm sorry but i'm just not because i don't want to dig for the articles i could probably find them very easily uh i'm just uh there's ads on the side of fox news and one of them is uh, just very distracting sorry i don't want to make fun of, there's a person in it and they're not a pretty looker so uh okay so cameron diaz but these links will be in the description of the video Cameron Diaz wants to normalize married couples sleeping apart or in different homes. My parents do this, not in different homes. They're not wealthy that way, uh, but they do sleep in different bedrooms <clears throat> and in different beds. Obviously, there's not one bed that stretches between bedrooms, but they sleep in different beds, in different rooms. They've done this since I was living with them for sure. But how old? I was probably, I don't know, I was probably like 15 or 16 when they started doing this. I'm 30, I'll be 33 here in a few days. 
they've just done this forever. And, uh, and it is weird. I'm, I'm interested to see somebody else talk about this. It is weird. Here's the deal. They do it. Here's why they say they do it. My mom says, you know, that he doesn't want to be surrounded by pets. All the pets sleep in bed with her. They've got a lot of small dogs and cats and, and it's, they're just more comfortable. They're just more physically comfortable. My parents, I believe, even though they don't have a very emotionally intimate relationship, they do still love each other. And as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, they still fuck gross, but good. You know, I'm good. If I had to choose, do you want your parents to fuck or not? I would say awesome. Just don't give me details, you know? No anal, dad. That's what I would say. I would say, no anal, don't give me details. I hope you fuck. Um, no rimming. So Cameron Diaz just got can candid about the intimacy of marriage, sharing that she's an advocate for partners having some space from each other. I'm on board so far. During an appearance on Molly Sims' podcast, Lipstick on the Rim, speaking of rimming, uh, you know, the image of uh, uh, red lipstick on a man's asshole. The women were speaking openly about their marriages. Amis Gormley, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, Sim's best friend, admitted that her husband snores and they've chosen to sleep separately. That's the thing that my parents both do. I, growing up, like, you know, my mom would say, God, your dad snores so much. And it's like, mom, I literally think you're fucking dying every night. I wake up and you are <laughs> making that noise. No joke. That's what it sounds like. Uh, she eventually got a CPAP machine that helped. But, you know, they both probably woke each other up constantly. We should normalize separate bedrooms, Diaz said. To me, I would literally, I have my house, you have yours. Okay, that was a weird sentence because they just, they didn't paraphrase. They just took exactly what she said. To me, I would literally, I have my house, you have yours. We have the family house in the middle. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, now we're seeing a little bit of where... Cameron Diaz has some money in the bank. Yeah. So there's not only two houses, there's a third house for the kids to play Xbox in. I will go and sleep in my room. You go sleep in your room. I'm fine. Now we're talking. How about different rooms? Do we need three houses for the Diaz family? And we have the bedroom in the middle that we can convene in for, you know, our relations. Or you could, you know, I don't know. You want to have a sex bed? How gross is the sex bed going to be? I don't know. I think split the sex up into all three beds. Fuck in the kids' rooms. Who cares? Tell them to get out of the living room. Turn off the PlayStation. No more BoJack Horseman. We're fucking on the couch. And we have the bedroom in the middle that we convene in for, you know, our relations, she added. When it was suggested that Diaz's comments might create a bad headline. Dude, America is so fucking dumb sometimes. Like a bad headline. Like... The choice between man and wife to husband and wife to sleep in different beds is like, who cares, right? Like, I hope you guys see, I'm not coming at this from uh, who cares about what I'm not talking about this from the angle of let's talk about Cameron Diaz's fucking sleeping situation. I'm talking about this. Like, is this. Is this modern marriage? Is it realistic that 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 couples, husband, husband, wife, wife, husband, wife, whatever, sleep in different, you know, who gives a fuck? A bad headline, you know, if you're, and if you're still following like Cameron Diaz in 2023, like I'm not a, I don't know celebrities, but I know enough to say like, you know, update your compendium of celebrities Diaz admitted that she's uh previously shared her beliefs on the topic I already said it she quipped I don't know if that's a quip to just say I already said it a quip would be like saying something witty to just say I already said it how about she stated I don't feel that way now because my husband is so wonderful I said that before I got married she teased in 2015, Diaz married Good Charlotte rocker Benji Madden. Oh, and so if you don't know who Good Charlotte is, Good Charlotte are uh, guys that are like 45 and then they sing about being in high school. So the couple welcomed their daughter Radix in 2019 via surrogate. Uh, you know, it's a little girl, I think, or boy or whatever. Daughter, they said. Okay, it's a little girl. I'm not going to make fun of her, but Radix. Famously private, Diaz opened up about her decision to get married in an interview with Harper's Bazaar. 
It's pretty awesome, she said of marriage. I didn't think it was something I'd do, and I don't know if I'd have done it if I hadn't met my husband. It was a surprise. Well, you know, um, like, that's so stupid, by the way. I don't think I'd have married somebody if I hadn't met my husband. If you're a woman that wants to marry a man, you're, gonna, you're not going to get married unless you meet your husband. You know what I mean? Does, is that obvious? Am I just sick and that makes sense in my brain? Like, yeah. You don't get married if you haven't met the person you want to marry. <laughs> you know, like, no, like, you didn't think you'd do it. I don't know if I'm going to get married, but I'm definitely not going to get married if I don't meet my wife. Does that, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And there are, though, I will say, I don't know if this is universal, but in America, there are marriages where people just get married. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Marriage sucks if you don't want to be married to the person you're married to. That's hell. That is like signing up to go to prison, dude. Getting married to Benji was the best thing that ever happened to me. She told in style, my husband's the best. He's the greatest human being and he's my great partner. Marriage is certainly hard and it's a lot of work. You need somebody who's willing to do the work with you because there's no 60-40 marriage. It's 50-50 period all the time, she said of their union. Can we talk about the beds? I don't know if I was ready when I got married, but I knew Benji was special. He's just a good man. There's no bullshit. It's really refreshing. I'm really grateful for him. Choosing to focus on her family, Diaz stepped away from acting. Okay, this is the rest of it. It's just, okay. She stepped away from acting a decade ago. Well, good for her. But she will make her return in an upcoming film, Back in Action with Jamie Foxx. What's the deal with Jamie Foxx? There was that situation. Um, he like got in an accident, didn't he? Get in an accident. Uh was it a year ago now? I never looked into it because I don't care. I mean, like, I hope he's okay. But uh, I hope Jamie Foxx is okay in the same way that I kind of hope everybody's okay. Uh, like, I'm not going to... I will, if I know you personally or I'm in your circle and your life at all, like, if we interact day to day, I will maybe put an effort to help you be okay. But, like, yeah, I'm not going to Google how's Jamie Foxx. So it's an interesting article, right? Um, clearly done just so Diaz can get her name back out there. Like it doesn't have anything to do really with the beds. Uh, headlines can't be trusted and headlines. And I wanted to say this too. I understand that I'm, I'm presenting this as a podcast where I'm learning things and hopefully me learning things out loud, like learning about things out loud will help you guys understand how you feel about things. That really is kind of the point of this podcast. The number one point is to be entertaining, but the next point is like, it's about comedy. It's about following, you know, your dreams and shit. And it's about like, we're learning together. I know that mainstream media sources are shitty. Like I know that they suck and that uh, they shouldn't be relied upon for actual information. You know, um, like why is Fox news covering, uh, what bed Cameron Diaz sleeps in. You know what I mean? Like that's news in America, at least probably everywhere today. That's news. I don't know about everywhere. If you're living in a third world country, I'm almost certain that celebrity is probably not what you're talking about. It's probably like <laughs> a seventh bomb this week, but it's interesting. I think, you know, what comes to mind is like <sighs> the way that people view marriage in America is very different depending on what your what, uh, where you're coming from in life, you know, like if you're a, a fundamentally religious person in America, you probably think marriage is between a man and a woman. You're probably not cool with gay marriage. Um, you probably think sex shouldn't happen before you're married. And my guess is at some part of your brain, you think you have to sleep in the same bed. And if you don't sleep in the same bed, and I, I think this can be a secular thought as well, but if you don't sleep in the same bed, something's wrong, you know? Like there's a lot of discussion nowadays about um, polyamory, right? Which is when a woman wants to fuck a lot of guys and her boyfriend is a cuck. Uh, that's polyamory. So, uh, and so he just goes along with it. Um you know, like looking at relationships as something that's non-binary, and I don't mean that in a gender way, gendered way, whatever, like um, that there's not just like right and wrong. There's like, it's a very comprehensive, full spectrum take on what a relationship is in an intimate, loving, romantic relationship can be. 
And so like to have, you have to sleep in the same bed or it's unhealthy in a contemporary sense doesn't have to be the only way we look at things. Are you fucking happier if you're sleeping separate beds and just congregate to fuck? Is that better? You know, uh, if I had to guess, I, so I sleep in bed every night with my pit bull right next to me. Okay. And we don't fuck in case there is any subtext there that sounded like I have sex with my dog. I don't, um, I've tried and she just as always says no. So she's a, you know, she's not as big as a person, but she's big. She's 55, 60 pounds, whatever she is. And she's smack dab against me. And I like that. I like that. But she's also a dog. So I can like pet her. I can push her gently, but I can move her. I can, she doesn't have the same agency and autonomy that a person has. Okay. You know, if I were part of PETA, I would say maybe she deserves that agency and autonomy. Well, if I were part of PETA, I think their big thing now is that nobody should even have pets. So I should just open my front door and let this pit bull that will attack your dogs and children out because she's a wild animal, quote unquote. Um, but, you know, it's not the same as me sleeping. I get it. It's not the same as me sleeping with a human being. Being, sorry, I can't say ings right now. Uh, on On my left. It's not. I have more control. So if I was in a, a a bed every night where I had to give up, and some of you are married. Some of you probably sleep in the same bed as your, your spouse or partner or whatever every night. So you've got more insight than me. Let me know how you feel about this for real. Um, you know, I don't get to fucking shove my wife two feet to her left because she's elbowing me. My dog dreams a lot. When she dreams, she does the thing that dogs do where they, you know, have a have a seizure or whatever. Uh, and so I move her or I wake her up. Like those are things that I think would, would not be so nice to do to a sleeping human. Uh, dogs sleep rhythms are also way different than a human's. A dog can wake up and fall asleep in seconds. Whereas a human is going to take, you know, you woke me up now. It's going to be 20 minutes before I fall back to, to sleep. Um, I don't think I would like to have, I think sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm into cuddling. I'm a cuddle guy. I like to, I'm a cuddly boy. I like to touch a lady in lots of ways. And I think that there are times where I would like to be smack dab next to each other and cuddling and things. But I know that after I fall asleep, you know, like going to sleep, I'm like, isn't it nice that we're cuddling? Once I fall asleep and you enter that realm where you're like really fucking tired and all your brain cares about is the sleep. Then I'm going to be like, get the fuck away from me. Stop stealing the covers. Like I'm pushing you. You're making me too warm. Like all this stuff. So there are times when I would like to have a human being next to me. Um, I sound like an alien, but there are definitely, I think there are more times when I would be like, yeah, this is not as comfortable. I'm not as rested and relaxed. Um, I'm not as rested the morning after and I'm not as relaxed the night of when I'm like sharing this no, I'm six foot two. I weigh 270 pounds. There's not a bed on fucking earth that is big enough. Okay. I'm not even that tall, but like no bed has enough space. I need a, a bed that is as big as a bedroom to like sprawl out on in order for me to feel totally relaxed. Uh, and I don't really move that much in my sleep, but I still like, that's what I need. So personally, I think I wouldn't want that. Now, does that mean that your marriage is unhealthy? Sometimes. I think in the case of my parents, it actually is, it goes both ways. I think that they, their reasoning for why they do it is correct. I think it's right that they would be, they're more comfortable not messing, not sharing a bed with each other and a thousand pets. But I also think that my parents have never done a good job of being um, emotionally intimate and communic burp, communicative. And so my guess is that there is a seed in between, what am I saying? Bringing up seed and bedtime and MC also is like, there's some sperm joke here, but like there is, there's a, there's a, there's an iota of coldness in why my parents do it too. And so I think, and this is obvious, but I think if you're, if you're honest about why you're actually wanting to sleep in separate beds. Because I do think, I do think sharing, like sleeping is very, you're very vulnerable when you sleep. So sharing that space with somebody 
Yeah, it is intimate. And I think it probably can strengthen the relationship. So you have to be honest with yourself, your partner, whatever, like, why do we actually want to do this? You know, are we just giving up a benefit because it's easier to not find a way that we can sleep in the same bed comfortably? You know, I just think, uh, I think a lot of marriages suck. And I do think that traditions can be important. Uh, and so you have to really be honest about with yourself and them about why you want to do this, if that's what you want to do. Okay, enough time talking about how other people sleep in beds. Mm. Uh, all right. So the next article is a little bit more serious, definitely more political. Again, I'll say not a political podcast. I just click on articles that I think sound interesting. Um, so this is about Colorado ruled, um, Colorado Supreme Court ruled basically that Trump can't be on the ballot. So this is about that ruling, but it also is about how it might be a bad thing, I think. But again, this is coming from CNN. So when they say this is bad, what they're saying is this might get Trump elected. Just know that, okay? So this this article, I'm going to guess ahead of time, is definitely coming from a place of we don't want Trump to get elected, okay? I, You guys, I talked, I think, the last episode about how I feel about Trump and would I want him to be the president. At this point, I will tell you before I read this, I don't want Trump to be president and I don't want Biden to be president. Um, and uh, I'm Palestinian and Biden is um, vehemently pro-Israel and I'm not anti-Israel and I'm not, I don't think uh, I'm, wow, I'm going off on a whole tangent. I'm just going to, I don't like Biden or Trump. Okay. Before we read this. So unprecedented Colorado ruling puts courts at the center of Trump's fate next year. The Colorado Supreme Court's decision that Donald Trump is constitutionally constitutionally ineligible to appear on the ballot and next year's state primary represents a stunning rebuke of the former president and a new level of accountability for his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. So, right. They're saying that he is constitutionally ineligible to appear on the ballot. And I need to research this more, so there's probably more to it than this. But they're saying he's constitutionally ineligible to appear on the ballot because he tried to overturn the 2020 election. Okay. Uh, represents a stunning rebuke of the former president and a new level of accountability for his efforts to overturn the 2020 election, threatening his 2024 electoral prospects in a way the four criminal indictments against him have not. While the courts, and first of all, I'm going to say, I think somebody trying to overturn it, like they lose and then they try to overturn an election, I think is, in the case of Trump at least, a little dishonorable and certainly dishonest. Um, but he's a businessman and he wants to win. He's also a celebrity. You put him on a game show where he literally says, you're fired. Um, it's he's, he's a zero-sum kind of guy. So it's not, it's not unexpected. I think you should, as a presidential nominee, be able to lose and try to overturn the loss and still try to be president again. I do think that. So I'm hoping they're saying somehow he went about it was the reason that he shouldn't be able to run again. Not that he did it because that he did it. I think that's, there's kind of nothing more America than losing in a fair contest and then being like, no, nah, but I'm still want to win, you know, like that's, America is great and shitty for the same reasons. You know, you can do whatever the fuck you want means, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of school shootings. Not awesome, right? Not great. We're just, that's just, and we're not going to do anything about it. So, you know, uh, but it, it's also like you can, uh, you can uh, wear a fucking Santa Claus outfit and, and play drum with your balls if you, you know, you got to get a permission from the, the state house first, but you can do that on a corner somewhere and call it art. Like America is great and horrible kind of because it's a wild place where you can sort of do whatever you want within reason. So it's important to me that we continue to be able to do that sort of thing, kind of whatever we want within reason. But it's also important that as we're doing whatever we want without reason, we try to navigate those waters in a healthy way that protects 
especially innocent people and vulnerable people, you know? Um, and I'm not just saying, I, that's not a blanket statement that meant minorities. I more so meant like the kids I fucking mentioned that get shot sometimes. So while the court's 4-3 decision Tuesday may not ultimately lead to the former president's removal from the ballot in Colorado or any other state because of the expected appeals. Again, so check this out. So he can lose the presidency. He can uh, try to appeal that process. He can then get his ability to uh, become president the next year revoked and then appeal that process. So like decisions in America are like so frustrating if you're just a regular person, if you're not a politician, because um, it'll be like, yes, we got it. Whatever you were fighting for, yes, we got it. And then it's immediately appealed by a higher court. Um, it's just, it can be very frustrating. While the courts, and it actually makes it feel like nothing is happening sometimes. Like there are certain things that need to happen and nothing ever happens because of bipartisan politics. So while the court's 4-3 decision Tuesday may not have ultimately led to the former president's removal from the ballot in Colorado or any other state because of the expected appeals, the ruling puts the country in uncharted territory, raising the shocking prospect that a major party's candidate could be barred from office. That is something that I don't think has ever happened. Uh, if you were the nominee last year or the president last year, you're the nominee the next year, whatever it is, like never, I think, has a nominee been told by courts. They've certainly been told by the people voting for them. No, no, we don't like you, but not by courts that you can't do it. It's perhaps the final exclamation point to cap off a year of unprecedented events encircling Trump. Where are we at time wise? Okay posing new and potentially grave challenges to American democracy heading into a tumultuous election year from a former president who embraces political chaos. Um, I don't love this idea that only Trump embraces chaos either. I don't like that. Uh, I'm not a Trump fan. I think he's a liar. I think he's funny, but I think he's a piece of shit. I think he's a deeply insecure, short-dicked piece of shit um, that made America look bad. But I also think he's honest in some ways. He just says a lot of wild shit. And some of it is the truth, probably the minority, if I had to guess, but some of it's true and it's truths that you wouldn't hear from other candidates or other politicians. So I appreciate when I hear those things, but then the rest of it, I'm like, wow, you're garbage. Um, I don't like when they say that only he thrives on the chaos. Um, he's not the only politician that's ever tried to pull the wool over um, his constituents' eyes or America's eyes. He's not the only politician that's ever lied in horrible ways. He's definitely not the only politician that's grabbed by anybody by the pussy. Uh, Hillary Clinton, her fucking email shit. You know, like, it's just, they, they're they like, look how bad Trump is. And look how everybody else is better than Trump. It's like, y'all are doing this. That's why we don't like any of you. I punched my microphone. I think, I don't have a survey. I've never read about it. I'm guessing. I'm guessing right now that most people probably feel like me and they're like, God, I don't like any of you. I get mad at my parents because they love Biden so much. It's like, dad, you moved here from 17. Uh, when you were 17 from the middle fucking East, you're a Palestinian boy through and through. And you support this guy. My dad's 81 and he could run laps around Biden in every way that you can run laps. And it's so frustrating to hear him like just never say anything negative about Biden only because he's a Democrat, because there are people that way. There are people that it's like, that's our candidate. Um, it's, and maybe it's an older generations thing, but that's our candidate. We're going to support him or her 100%. Doesn't matter. We're going to la 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 la. When you say negative shit about them and we're going to pretend like they're better than every other, every other, uh, candidate that's ever been. And then we're going to forget about them. You know, eight years later, they're going to, it's going to be like, they never existed. You know, all the bad shit that comes out about them, we're going to act like that. We're just, again, la, la, la. It's not real. But, you know, um, they all fucking suck. That's how I feel. They all fucking suck. Now, I have to operate within the system. When I was younger, I would have been like, let's burn it down uh, and then start from the ground up. I feel less that way now, mostly because I'm tired. Mostly because I'm just too tired to be a fucking anarchist. Not because I don't want to blow shit up, but because it's just a lot of work. It's hard enough to just pay the bills. You know, like I have this cold. I had to go to the grocery store to get medicine. I bought sushi to make my life easier. Just like, here's something I can just eat. I don't have to worry about cooking it. I'm fucking tired. If I had to, you know, rob a bank and uh, fucking uh, kidnap um, some, some, some fucking like spouse of a politician to make a statement... 
I just, I got to get a nap today. I got to get a nap. I got to get rest. I got to make sure I'm eating my vitamins. I don't have time to be an anarchist. So I operate within the system. That's part of the reason I love stand-up so much. You get to say things. Outside of the courtroom, Trump has increasingly embraced inflammatory rhetoric, musing about being a dictator should he retake power next year and launching attacks against his opponents reminiscent of Nazi propaganda. Oh, please. Trump repeated his incendiary comments about Nazi propaganda. What are they like showing Democrats on a poster and they've got long noses? Like, did you know that all Democrats smell like curry? That's that's Nazi propaganda. What do you mean Nazi propaganda? There's propaganda on both sides. Again, I'm not even trying to defend Trump. I just get so annoyed reading these articles from both, whether it's Fox or a left-leaning site like this is CNN. I get so annoyed because they treat us like we're fucking stupid. Trump repeated his incendiary comments about immigrants at an event in Iowa Tuesday evening, pushing back against criticism from the Biden campaign and others that he was echoing Adolf Hitler. I'm going to go, I'm going to say this. I feel very strongly about this. Trump is not Adolf Hitler. Okay, now I know that might sound like uh, a vote of support in fucking 2023 that I think Trump is not Hitler. Therefore, you should vote for him. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but but Hitler uh, killed six million people in horrible ways. So there is a difference between somebody who lies on Twitter and is a racist um, and has t a talkable and thinks that makes him cultured uh, and somebody who murdered six million people. So. You know, when you start talking like that, it makes what you say sound really stupid. When you start trying to convince me that Trump is Hitler, then then you look so dumb that uh, you lo lose all credibility. You know, you want me to believe you, CNN. I'm in the middle. I'm the voter that you want to convince to vote in the way that you want me to vote. And because you're talking like this, there's no fucking chance I'm going to believe anything you're saying. You want me to think that this dumb fucking ginger... Is smart enough to kill some Jew? No, uh, is you know, it's just you. You give up all credibility when you start talking like this. You do. Now, do you want to talk about how he has convinced people to believe things that are not true, and and that's a similarity, sure. But when you, but that's not what's happening here. It's crazy what's going on. They're ruining our country, and it's true. They're destroying the blood of our country. That's what they're doing. They're destroying our country. They don't like it when I said that. Trump said, and I've never read Mein Kampf. Okay, well now Trump now. Probably not good to bring up Mein Kampf on your own, I will say. So I'm going to backpedal just a little bit. If he's, you know, uh, I, here's here's how I feel about that. He's wrong. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working with people that don't. I've worked in restaurants. And when you work in restaurants, sorry I'm talking so much. I would like to just read this. I mean, it's a podcast. It's my podcast. So fuck yourself if you don't want me to talk. But I understand we're taking a long time to get through this article. Um, I've spent a lot of time working in restaurants and be because of that, I've spent a lot of time working with, uh, men and women who don't have their citizenship for sure, but don't have a green card. They're here illegally a lot. I've spent a lot of time doing that. And now that's all anecdotal. I understand, but almost all of them have been hardworking honest, loving people that are just trying to make some money to take care of their family. I still think they should get their citizenship. I still think that they should have to do that. But they're not, from my perspective, what's ruining our country is political rhetoric that nobody can connect to. That's something that's ruining our country. Um, is Pablo cooking pancakes at IHOP ruining our country? You know, if you want Pablo's job, be better at making pancakes than him. Uh, why is a Mexican that doesn't speak English able to do your job better than you? If you want, if you, if the argument is they're taking our jobs, I, first of all, I'm not sure I even believe that that's true. Um, <laughs> there's so much I can say here. Oftentimes when I feel like people don't, they, they're unemployed, if their excuse is, uh, I can't get a job because of immigrants. There's something else going on there. They're mentally unwell. You know, it's got nothing to do with actual immigrants taking their jobs. Even if an immigrant did take their job. Again, you were replaceable. Don't be replaceable. But I think Trump here is 
being pretty, you know, to quote Hillary, deplorable, but um, he knows what the people he's talking to want to hear. He knows that. And he likes when people like him. That's way different than actually convincing people to exterminate a, a race of people. So I'm not trying to be a Trump apologist, by the way. If that's what it's sounding like, let me know that I sound like a Trump apologist and I'll tr try to learn from it because that's super not what I'm doing. I think he's fucking up big time, especially bringing up Mein Kampf on his own. That's stupid. Um, you're making the comparison way too easy. But also, um, it's just both sides. When I read this, I just like mourn for America because both sides sound so fucking stupid, you know? And if you're a Republican and you're like, well, Trump's not my president. He doesn't re represent the Republican Party. Yes, he fucking does. You elected him. You elected him. You can't say that anymore. You can no longer say Trump is this outlier that doesn't represent conservative politics. He represents it well enough that he got into fucking office. So figure out your argument because that's not going to work anymore. To Trump's detractors, the Colorado decision signals that the legal system is finally beginning to hold the former president <coughs> accountable for his efforts to overturn his election loss in 2020 and the attack on the U.S. Capitol that unfolded January 6, 2021. Accountability for inciting an insurrection. It's about time, wrote Re Representative Adam Schiff, a California Democrat who led the House's first impeachment against Trump. But Tuesday's ruling also could help propel Trump back to the White House, emboldening his supporters who have embrace the former president's message that the criminal cases against him are unjustified and are a key reason he should be returned to power. Trump's allies rallied against, railed against the Colorado decision coming to his defense just as they have following each of his four criminal indictments this year. It's making me vape. Democrats are so afraid that President Trump will win on November 5th that they are, uh, 2024, that they are illegally attempting to take him off the ballot. Elise Stefanik of New York, the House's number three Republican, said in a statement. Even former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, the most prominent anti-Trump Republican running for president, was critical of the Colorado decision. You know, he's probably not going to win in Colorado regardless. Let's be real. He was never going to win in Colorado. It's not even going to hurt him to lose Colorado. Colorado is so fucking blue. It's, uh, it's unreal. And it's actually not. What is the... I had this pulled up just in case. It's not that big of a difference. I mean, so Hillary won by 4.9% in Colorado. Um, that's a lot. And I don't think this, you know, it's just the elect first, uh, don't even get me started on the electoral college. That shit is wild. Makes you feel so useless. I can't overstate the consequences of this evening. And I also want to stress how we now have two major, very critical Trump election issues barreling toward the court. They will have to decide both of these one way or another, said CNN senior Supreme Court analyst Joan Biskupic. The former president has been indicted four times with criminal trials that could play out at the same time he's campaigning against President Joe Biden and potentially simultaneously fighting in court to get back on the ballot. Excuse me. In a poll from the New York Times and Siena College released Tuesday, there was no clear leader between the two, with Trump taking 46% to Biden's 44% among registered voters. Among those who are, at this early stage, considered likely to vote, Biden takes 47% to Trump's 45%. So this is so stupid, though, because popular, you know, popular vote doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but it doesn't really matter because of the Electoral College. Smarter people than me that are more well-informed than me could explain that better. And, and maybe I'm just completely wrong. But like, I see these percentages broken down and I'm like, yeah, but that's not how we elect people. We elect people on a state-by-state -state basis. So who cares about that giant number? It matters how those percentages break down into smaller percentages. The Times Siena survey finds the former president leading Biden among registered voters who did not participate in the 2020 election, a finding that mirrors other recent polling. CNN's Ariel Edwards Levy wrote. Where are we at? Okay. So uh, we're almost done here. AI recreated how these dead stars would have aged. So here's an old ass picture of Michael Jackson. That's crazy. He became even whiter in that AI generated picture. Uh, okay, let's finish this up. Up until the Colorado. Uh, so impact of the unprecedented ruling. 
Up until the Colorado Supreme Court's ruling, the numerous court-driven efforts to disqualify Trump from the ballot were not succeeding at blocking him from office, as one state court after another ruled against the lawsuits. Even in Colorado, the trial judge concluded last month that Trump had engaged in an insurrection, but that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment's insurrectionist ban doesn't apply to, to the presidency? Interesting. Well, that sounds wrong to me. Uh, if the president leads an attack against his own country, that should be uh, frowned upon. The Colorado Supreme Court reversed that finding on Tuesday. Now, with that court's unprecedented ruling, the notion of the courts removing Trump from the ballot in 2024 is no longer theoretical. It's a real possibility. Um, you know, Democrats are so quick to point the finger that they don't. And I think the finger should be pointed, by the way. I think it is fair to, to point fingers, but they're so quick to point the finger to there's, it's almost like virtue signaling. You guys know virtue signaling where you're like, I support black people just so black people like you just so, and not even black people, just like white people that already agree with you like you. Um, by the way, you should support black people. This is not, I'm not about to say you shouldn't. Um, but like you, it's not about, it's not about being a compassionate, loving person doing moral things and ethical things. It's about getting the attention for it. The, the Democratic Party really uh, suffers from that. And it makes them, again, it like hurts the credibility. They're so quick to point the finger at Trump, they don't consider that it might be a poor strategy. Even though that finger should be pointed, timing matters. Timing matters. Uh, how you do it matters, you know? Um, so like, are people in Colorado... I've got a friend who's a journalist in Colorado, um, Michael Carlick. He's awesome. Look up his work. C or excuse me, K A R L I C K. Right? There might not be a C. Um, really fucking smart guy. Handles this shit. I'm gonna call him and talk to him about this. But it's like I'm looking at that. I'm like, are there people in in Colorado that are trying to get reelected? So they're like, the best way I can do that is to shit on Trump. I don't even trust it. I don't trust it. Um, you know, I, here's how I feel about the two parties. I don't trust their Democrats really want me to think that they have my best interest at heart. I don't believe that for a fucking second. And the Republicans don't give a fuck about me at all. And they are okay with me knowing that. And the problem that I'm running into as somebody who grew up very liberal, uh, I'm a, I, you know, for a decade, I was a broke heroin addict. So it's not exactly like, <laughs> you know, as far as fiscal issues, I wasn't very conservative. I'm struggling with this because I'm like, you know, I don't like the Republican Party either. I think they do lack compassion in some ways, uh, especially on social issues. But I'm like, but I would rather them just be assholes to my face than behind my back. You know, that's what I'm running into. Now, that's never going to translate into a vote for Trump for me personally. It's never going to do that. Uh, but it's not because it's... It's not only because Trump is how Trump is. It's also because I don't, you know, even though I don't really take him at his word, what he says are his policies I don't agree with. I'm still trying to look at the policies, but we get so distracted by personalities, which when it comes to a presidency, I do think personality is important because this is the figurehead of a country. You know, he's, he's he or she's the person that's going to go interact and, and represent us nationally internationally excuse me um so personality does matter but like we almost stop talking about what actually matters here and we just focus on like who's more wrong who's more of an asshole who's a bigger liar um and so yeah i'm just i'm running into a roadblock here as i'm as i'm trying to figure out who i'm going to vote for because uh more and more it just feels like there's no good options you know uh, if you're somebody that's voting independently, let me know what you think. And I know a lot of you live in countries that aren't America, but my guess is I'm very politically uninformed. I'm working on it. That's a big part of this podcast taking this left turn that it took a month ago to, to do what we're doing here. I'm trying to become a more informed uh, human, not just citizen. Um, I want to be a smarter guy, but um, you probably know more than I do about U.S. politics. Uh, and I don't actually care if it's just U.S. politics. I would love to hear your takes. Alex, I'm talking to you, buddy. But I would love to hear all of your takes on um, 
how, what do politics look like in your country? Are you running into these same roadblocks? You know, and if you've gotten to this point of the podcast, I really appreciate you guys. It's not easy to listen to my dumbass talk uh, with a head cold for an hour. So thank you. I hope you've enjoyed the amen. I will talk to you next week. Oh, fucking uh, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Bye.